Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen. Thank you. Let's be seated. Well, it's good to be here this morning, share God's Word with you. You know, it's amazing how September 11, 2001 was a day that turned our nation spiritual. <laughs> you remember where you were? We live amongst young people that weren't even born and it seems to be somewhat distant. I remember back in 1963, after another shocking word was sent out to the world, the president is dead. Remember where you were at that time? Unbelievable. John F. Kennedy, young, vibrant, dynamic, cut down by an assassin's bullet, and the nation was plunged into grief. Not since the time, the end of World War II, did people flock to the churches in greatest numbers. Ministers changed their sermons. They preached on comfort, encouragement, hope in America. I forget how long ago it was, and I think they probably repeat it, but there was a documentary on the royal family. The, I think it was called The House of Windsor, public TV. And it recounted the passing of King George VI, 1952. And although I should have remembered it, sad to say I wasn't. The announcement came out, the king is dead. George VI had died at the age of 56 in his sleep. And it plunged England into a time of retrospection. He was a king who brought them, as quiet as a man as he was, into a place of, uh, through World War II. Uh, there was an election of a socialist government at the time. He brought them through that. Uh, much of England lost its, um, its empire. Uh, many of the countries that they owned uh, were, were turned independent. He, tiresome, tireless work that he had committed. And it brought England back to the churches. The loss of a king. It's amazing what that does. But if we go back another 700 years before the birth of Christ in Bethlehem, there was another sad announcement that was made. The king is dead. This is Uzziah. Uh, king Uzziah reigned over Judah for an amazing 52 years. Began when he was 16, if you can imagine that. And for the most part, as you read in the scriptures, he did have some weaknesses and some faults, but despite these, there was not a man who reigned as the king over such a nation since the time of David. He was a good king. And so when Isaiah hears this, it brings him no small amount of grief, no small amount of sadness. Isaiah was a friend of the king, and some even said it could be that there was a, a relationship maybe as part of a family member. We don't know. But Isaiah frequented the palace, and they were friends. And as Isaiah hears these words, he heads on to the temple to worship God, to find comfort and peace because of the loss of a king, but the loss of a friend. Friends, when sorrow comes, when life presses upon you, I think the best place is to be found in the house of the Lord. Not that we shouldn't always find our place in the house of the Lord. It should be a place that we frequent. But when, when the struggles of life pound upon us and we feel that everything is just given up, we ought to find that the house of God is a place that we frequent, that we find encouragement because... The Lord is there, and we can find hope in him as we quickly turn to him. When Isaiah went up to the house of the Lord, he knew the king was dead, but he found out that God was not dead. His friend was dead. His king, the Judah king, was dead, but God was not dead. He lost his earthly ruler, whom he loved, but he caught a fresh glimpse of the king of kings the one who loved him. It's at this time, and even from our scripture reading, that Isaiah found four things, four things I want to share with you this morning, that he was drawn to at this very difficult time in his life. 
We begin in verses 1 through 4 where Isaiah saw the Lord. Follow along again as I read these sections. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one having six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet. With twain he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah saw something of the nature, the character of God. He, he caught a glimpse, a, a peek in the curtain, a, a crack in the door. He, he saw something that was described even as Moses in Exodus 15. Glorious in holiness, fearful in praises to see something that was beyond description, beyond words, and he presents it in such a way that he just catches a pinch, a, a small sliver of what is there to be seen. The vision of God high and lifted up on his throne. He saw God as the central object of all praise, surrounded by the heavenlies, the courtiers, the angelic beings, the seraphim, what a vision. What a scene. But would you note with me here, it's only Isaiah who sees this glorious vision. If there were others, and I, I don't know, maybe I read too much into it, but I can't help but believe that there were others in the temple. That there were others in some part. Nobody else sees this. Isaiah himself sees it, and, and there was no such revelation given to any. We don't see him saying, we saw the Lord. It says, I saw the Lord. He has set aside privilege for this special occasion. You know, there's a sense that we here this morning, we have a corporate worship, but we are still very much made up as individuals. We worship corporately. I pray as the pastor over the body, corporately we do it as a body. But we hopefully won't worship as individualistic in the sense that we ignore or we disregard others around us. We need to be mindful of those who are around us. We just don't come and sit in the pew and, and say, well, that's it. Individualistic, we are part of the whole body. It is possible for one person in the same pew to be moved to tears and somebody right next to be totally unmoved cold as to what is being said. It is quite possible that one could be sitting there and hearing the very same things and repent when the other one continues to sit in the same area unrepentant, cold-hearted. It can be possible for one to be hearing the claims of Christ surrendering and the other desperately resisting the persuasion of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you today, as we sit here, how are you? Willing to hear the voice of God? Willing to hear what the Holy Spirit says? Or is this a matter of ritual? A matter of something that we just go through, expected to be done, uh, asked to come and we do it out of ceremony, out of ritual? As God is opening up your heart and he knocks at your heart, allow the King of Kings to speak to your heart even as he had spoke to Isaiah's heart. Isaiah met with God. He had a revelation of the greatness of the Lord, and his life was changed forever. From chapter 6 on is a different prophet, a different ministry, a different life. The same living God is here today to meet with us and to whoever will call upon his name. Corporate, individuals, yet together. Listen, Isaiah didn't get this revelation just because he was a prophet. You see the character of Isaiah, and you see he was a man who had a soft heart. His ears were attentive, and God chose him 
spoke to him, revealed unto him himself because of the nature and the character of what he saw of that prophet. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, and you know the verse, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is, not the next word, perfect towards him. It's an unusual word. It comes from a similar word, shalom. This is shalom. And it means the, the principle of being completely devoted to. Shalem is related to the word shalom, which is peace and stillness. So he says, God is searching, the eyes of the Lord looking for the heart that is disposed to him. Perfect, we think of, well, he's, he's above reproach. No, it's a heart that is sensitive, that is disposed to God. He's looking for a vessel that he can speak to and be filled in his work. Isaiah was listening, and Isaiah saw the Lord. Hearts to be sensitive to the leading of God. But secondly, verse 5, Isaiah saw himself. So he sees the Lord, this glimpse, this fraction of what he saw, but he also, in this passage, sees himself. Look at what he says. Then said I, Woe is me! For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This woe isn't just like holding upon the horse. Woe, stop, you know. This is like, ah, a complete cry, a scream of utter disgust in what he sees in himself. Isaiah saw himself as he never quite saw himself before. He did not see himself in the way that we would see ourselves in the mirror. We're getting ready for church this morning, and we put the tie on, and we put the coat on, and we look, and is everything right? You know, you don't want to get up there, and you're there laughing because he's got his tie over this. I never saw it, you know. I look in the mirror, and I said, boy, I look good. That isn't what he's saying. He says, I see myself as I truly am, not as the outward appearance as man sees, but I see myself as I truly am. I'm not the best person here, because God is with me. He cries out, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Those that are around me of unclean lips have seen the Lord of hosts, the King. And this is always true. The closer we get to the Lord, the more we see our sins. We have a little light in our bathroom, probably, I think it's like two watts. And it allows us to go from the bed to the bathroom at night without turning on all the lights to wake the other person up. And you can see just enough to get from the bed to the bathroom. But I can't see much else. But if I turn on the 60-watt bulb... I can see all the dust bunnies and all the things that are laid out all around me. The more light, the more is being revealed. The closer that I draw to God, the more that I see myself. The more that I understand who I am. And contrary-wise, the farther away I am from God, the less I see of my sinful nature. The more I think of myself as being a good person, a prideful person. The times when you do feel that you've made it, that you've arrived, that you're knocking on the door of perfection is an indication that I have been absent from prayer, that I've been absent from worship, that I've been absent from opportunities to draw to God. It sits as a, a marvelous picture as I draw close to Him, as I understand those things, then all of a sudden I see myself as I really am and it says, Lord, I need you more. I need you more. So this is Isaiah's testimony. When Peter was closest to the Lord Jesus, he said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Unusual thought when I first read that. He's there with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter says, Depart from me. I'm just, I'm just unworthy of being in your presence. The Apostle John writing in the book of Revelation on the island of Patmos, says, I fell at his feet as though dead. 
Who is worthy to come into the presence of this one? Look at me. I'm not worthy at all, and I fall in his presence. Ever feel like that in front of people? More often than not, we kind of fuck ourselves up and, you know, I'm better than this guy. I think especially Americans, we do that quite often. You know, no man's going to put me down. I'm better than anybody else. But before the Lord, it's different. A lost sense of God will bring a lost sense of sin. But a renewed sense of God brings a renewed awareness of our own sinfulness. The refreshment of diving into God's Word is not to build up my own character, but it's to allow me to see the grace of God that looks upon such a sinful person as I am and says, yes, you are my child. I love you. I gave my son for you. And yet if I fall away from that, you know, we, we sing these hymns, you know, what a Savior. Look what he did for me. And sometimes we can go through them and they just... I just know them by heart, but hallelujah, what a Savior that I was chosen and picked for such a redemption. So Isaiah saw the Lord. He sees himself. Thirdly, he sees the cleansing power of God. And I, I can't help but praise him for this. You know, when you, when you think about it, if it wasn't for the cleansing power, the, 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 the cleaning of the sin and guilt, we would be so miserable. We would just be so destitute and desperate in life. Uh, verses 6 and 7. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips. And thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. A live coal, a burning coal, speaks of purification and cleansing. In the old days, the, uh, the wound and the battlefield was cauterized, and they'd get a hot iron, and they'd put it on there to clean that wound and clean the infection and seal that up. In this particular case, it was brought from the seraphim from off the altar of sacrifice, and touch the lips of the prophet. That altar that the live coal was taken from was the altar of burnt offerings. The place where the blood was shed, the place where the priest would kill the animal to pay for the sin of the people. So it was the shedding of blood because they knew even as we do, without the shedding of blood there is no remission, there is no forgiveness, there is no cleansing. So you have the coal taken touched blood and fire and it speaks of the cleansing from sin that blood can wash away all sin but it also speaks of the cleansing and the purifying power the blood washes away the sin and the fire the refining of the positive holiness of God when God saves you what does he do he not only forgives your sin but he purifies you in order that he can look upon you and say this is my child. Of all that Isaiah saw in himself, the woe is me and all of the, the, the ones around him and everything. He says, how could God favor me? And yet, by the touching of his lips representing his whole body, by that coal from the altar, God could say, you are purified. You are clean. You are set aside for my use. So God applies his cleansing power to our lives, the, the eternal blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That washes away the sins of the old life. And then he sets us on the whole new life, refining us by the spirit of his holiness, working in us day by day and changing us as we are willing to be changed, as we are willing to be changed. He calls us righteous because of the blood of his Son, and then he marks us as righteous through the working of the Holy Spirit, the fire of the Holy Ghost. This is the work of God and the only work that can be done. It's amazing how we live in the... I heard on the news the president had released, was it 45 prisoners doing this at the end of his, his rule or reign or whatever you want to call it. 
releasing them from prison. Government agencies, social workers, psychiatrists, and even modern education. They all try to make a change in man's life for that which can't be done. We we'll put him in prison. We give him other programs. We, we provide something to reform the lives of the criminal, the sinful man. But they are powerless, aren't they? They are powerless to make the change. But it's God that comes into their life at a moment of time and revolutionizes a person and makes them a new creature in Christ. Many years ago, the success rate I had read about of rehabilitating a hardline drug addict was pitifully low. A government study, a United States government study undertaken found that the success rate of the detox centers in getting people off of drugs permanently, this is over a seven year period of time, was between two and nine percent. And you hear on the uh, you know, this movie star or this this uh, musician or, or whatever, well, he was in detox and he was in this program and he tried and tried and now he's dead because of some overdose. And so the 2 to 9% was characteristic of it. The more intensive rehabilitation centers were not much more, 9 to 11%. That's all. Of the thousands upon thousands of dollars into the best of the educational programs to see that they could change a person's life and get them off. But this independent government study found that one group, Teen Challenge, which I'm sure you're familiar with, organization started by David Wilkerson in New York and is, has places around the world right now, had a success rate documented at 86%. 86%. When the government researchers asked what was the difference, they replied in their own words that the only thing that they could see is that Teen Challenge put their success rate to was what they called the Jesus factor. That's how the government interpreted the difference between 2 and 11% versus 86%. The Jesus factor. Teen Challenge continues to be making a difference because it's not a program based upon the wisdom of men. And we talked about that in our Bible, uh, in our Sunday school class this morning. But upon the power of God to transform a life inward, outward. They are not preaching rehabilitation, but they're preaching a radical regeneration. And they're not prescribing a substitute drug but they are prescribing a relationship with the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's just for the category of drug abuse. But what, for, what about all of the other areas of life where men are being crushed by sin? It is the power of the gospel. God's working in to regenerate that person, bringing them from death unto life. That is the difference in all situations. Isaiah saw God's cleansing power. The seraphim applied the blood-soaked, fire-purifying coal off the altar, and Isaiah experienced the sweetness of what God was doing in his own life. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Fourth, verses 8 and 9, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. The knowledge of God will make us all good in our relationships. And Isaiah got in with God and heard the heartbeat of a lost and dying people. Isaiah saw God and saw himself as he was and saw what God could do and did do in his life and it left him as a person who could say nothing else. But this indeed is the work of God. Friends, there is no other kind of people available to God for God to use. He uses sinful men to preach his gospel, men of unclean lips, because there's nobody else but he does it by applying 
the cleansing power of the blood of Christ and the purifying power of the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives in order that God can use them. I see Isaiah coming to the Lord in these verses. Here am I, send me, and it is a blank check for his whole life. He says, whatever you want. And I know we've talked about this. You've heard it umpteen times about saying, Lord, take my life. We sing it. We, we, we engage in conversation. But you know, all too often, our willingness to give the blank check has a, has, a, has a finger still hanging on to it. Lord, I'm willing to do. I'm, I'm happy to do. Uh, this is you know, all great. But we hold back. Brethren, the king is alive today. He is dead, but he is alive. He died for our sins upon the cross. He rose from the grave, and he lives today, and he lives forever. And he calls upon us to be of service to him. You know, we come to the Lord's table, and it's interesting that it's predicated upon the principle of our approaching that holy God. Think of how many times in your life you've partaken of the Lord's Supper. How many times we've come through and we've done the, the ritual, and I, I mean ritual in the sense of something that is patterned. We've done it many times. We've heard the words of the Apostle Paul in, in Corinthians. We've, we've heard the Gospel accounts. We know what Jesus had done. We've, we've revisited it as we come to Good Friday, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and, and Resurrection Sunday. But when he come again, Jesus tells us we do this in remembrance of him, we have to realize the great gap that had been spanned. The holy God still remains holy. He still remains even as Isaiah said, and we still remain even as Isaiah saw himself as being undone. I don't know about where you live, but the people around me still have unclean lips. <laughs> you know? They may be real sweet and kind as we go around our neighborhood and walk around and we talk, you know, and so forth. But of a truth, their heart is cold and blackened by sin, and hence their lips are unclean, and so we dwell amongst them. Some are more overtly unclean than others, you know, but that's the life that we live in as long as we're in this world. So we still have that holy God, and we still have our own sinfulness and the sinfulness of those around us. And as we come to this table, we see the one who bridged the gap. It's just not because, oh, I belong to the church, or, or, or you know, I know these things, or whatever. It brings us to the place of the great grace of God in our lives. What Jesus had done for us. We stand in the place of Isaiah and says, woe is me. But praise God for the cleansing power that even though I know I'm a sinner, I know that he is working in me to make me like unto his son. And that Jesus stands on my behalf and has removed the guilt, removed the shame. Even though Satan whispers it to me, you know, you're unworthy, you can't do this, da 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 I go back to the Word and I say, Jesus has taken away that. There's no finger that can be pointed at me. There's no nothing to be laid at my account. Nothing to be held against me because Jesus has done it all. So it's a great joy and great privilege that we come to the table of the Lord and to realize the greatness of the gap has been spanned by the love of the Savior. His willingness to do that which we could not do to make us his child, to bring us into his family, knowing who we are, knowing what we've done. I was in, had the privilege of going to uh, Australia a month ago, uh, in the second week in May for the 30th anniversary of the Hope Bible Presbyterian Church in Adelaide. And Australia was founded, as you may know, by basically by England. And the Anglican Church is throughout the, the, the country, the continent. And the Anglican Church is 
deader than the doornail. The churches that are right there in Adelaide and Hope Church is looking to maybe purchase one of the old buildings, ones that are hardly used. They have like 20 or 30 members. And and the pastor who was at the church right next door, uh, our, our pastor, Reverend Key, went to speak with him. And he says, he says, I'm leaving next week. And he says, why? And he said, these people don't want to hear anything. He said, when I preach the gospel to them, when I preach from God's word, they come to me after the service and said, we don't want to hear that. They tell the pastor, we don't want to hear God's word. So he says, I wash my hands of them. He said, well, what do they want? He said, they just want a social club, a place where they can gather together and enjoy things. Do they realize what's awaiting them? Do they realize that the, the, the they, the, 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 those who settled and, and planted those churches and gave and prayed in order that the gospel would be proclaimed throughout Australia are now dead and gone, you know, they've given them such a privilege. Do they realize that one day they're going to give an account for such an answer to the gospel? I don't think so. The other churches are called the Uniting Churches. They were the, all the mainline denominations and they got together. They don't call them United because they're still uniting. They're still never united, you know. And they are almost as dead. The gospel of Jesus Christ brings us to the place where we have answers for such things. Allow us to see that in this world only what God has given can he regenerate? Can he change a life? Can he bring hope and happiness and satisfaction? And one day when we do stand before the Lord, we have our advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, to stand in our place. And we don't have to say, well, I did it. I, you know, No, he says, he's mine. I died for this one and this one and this one. What a joy. What a privilege. Shall we pray? Father, we pause in the quietness of this morning and thanking you for what Isaiah experienced and that we were privileged to taste the same things, maybe not to the same extent, but nevertheless to experience the same things. For our leadership in this world is not based upon any king or president or prime minister, but the leadership that we have in this land is based upon the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. For earthly kings will come and go, and empires will rise and fall, but the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ is forever. And yet, Lord, we see ourselves in this world as people who are undeserving of this great King. Yet, Lord, what you have done is brought us, chosen us, picked us from all eternity, from beyond on the face of the earth, to make us your own. And that which was our stain has been cleansed. The coal from off the fires to clean the wound, to sanctify it, to purify it. The blood shed for the cleansing, for the forgiveness of sin. And now, Father, as we come to a part in our worship service where we remember what the Lord Jesus Christ had done, for us, sinners, we rejoice. May, Father, we continue to be pleased with our worship in Christ's name. Amen.